Welcome to this EBMS product reveal event. Thank you for joining us today. Each year we work on new features and roll them up into a new version that adds to the rich heritage of EBMS, bringing you, our client, value and efficiencies in your day-to-day -day workflow. Today, I'm going to invite our product manager, Randy Hackle, to join me virtually. And the, between the two of us, we're going to go through and highlight the various features coming to EBMS in version 8.4. The first new feature we'll look at today is EBMS License Management. How does EBMS handle licensing? We use concurrent licensing. This is the number of folks that can be logged in at any given time. In the example I have up here now, I have as a company nine licenses. Two of them are being consumed by a couple of Express POS stations I have. And then I have seven folks logged in across several different companies. And I can access this new management dialog by going into EBMS Server Manager and to the new Licenses shortcut on the left-hand side. This will help you keep track of who's logged in, into what companies, and how your concurrent licenses are being consumed. How does my EBMS app licensing work? Well, it's a little different than concurrent in that you have the option to subscribe to individual feature sets like my orders and my jobs, my tasks. And then with those subscriptions, you can assign them, you can allow workers and assign that license to a specific worker. Or you can use your concurrent licensing and allow a worker to use that feature and when they log in to my EBMS, it will consume a concurrent license. This is a great way to try a, an app, a feature set, before you subscribe. Next, we'll look at proposal signature capture. Just like in EBMS sales orders, we now have the ability in the proposal to capture a signature electronically. So if you have that customer across the desk from you, you can have them sign on that quote and store it all in a paperless fashion. We've also brought that same capability to the My EBMS My Proposals app. So if you're on site providing an estimate for the installation of a furnace or replacement of a garage door, you can have the customer sign directly within the app as well. With that, we're going to transition to Randy Hackle. Randy's working from home, and he's going to be presenting to us several more new features available in EBMS 8.4. Randy serves not only as product manager, but also as chief architect, engineer, and wears many hats here at Eagle Business Software focused on the EBMS product. Randy? Thank you, Nathaniel. It's great to be here today to share about all the many features we have added in EBMS 8.4. Let's dive in these in EBMS 8.4. First, we'll look at the level of a product ID. There are a number of product IDs already in EBMS. You have the main product ID, and you have a UPC. And in addition, there's a UPC or alternate ID at the level of a unit of measure. So why two more? For example, you might have a part which is manufactured in multiple plants around the world. And different countries will assign different UPC codes to the part they make, even though it's otherwise the identical part. So in EBMS, you can enter those UPCs. You can search for those UPCs. You can sort on those UPCs. And maybe, most importantly, you can do barcode scanning 
on those UPCs. And regardless of which of those three UPCs you scan, it will be the same part. Let's look at serialized IDs now and alternate IDs for those. So in distribution and retail, it's very common to take serialized inventory in from a manufacturer or from a vendor. In the service industry, many companies take in vehicles or machines for service. And those machines or vehicles often have a serial number assigned by the manufacturer. Sometimes, however, we want to have our own serial number that's independent from the manufacturer's serial number, and that's where the internal stock number comes in. For example, on an auto parts dealership, the dealer has an internal stock number for every vehicle, even though each vehicle has its own VIN. They want to maintain an independent number that is unique across all of their inventory, as opposed to a serial number, which could be just unique to the product. This stock number is available for entry at the time you create your serialized items. The number is available when you want to search for serialized items. And then when you're going to sell the serialized items, it's available as well. Let's go to search lists now. I'm going to bring back Drag and Dot from very, uh, about 10 years ago. We're going to look at customer vendor filters, additional inventory columns, and customer name sorting. Drag and Drop. This is a feature that was in EBMS maybe 10, maybe 15 years ago, but we removed it because customer feedback was that users were unexpectedly being able to drag parts to different categories unintentionally, and that made inventory management very difficult. By popular demand, we've brought back this feature by which you can move parts to different categories and customers and vendors, but we've made it more foolproof by requiring some Windows standard keys to be pressed. So now, if you drag the pointed paintbrush to a different folder, nothing will happen unless you're pressing down on the shift key. And that's Windows standard, as you might see in Windows File Explorer. This most affects the reports dialog. In the reports dialog, you also need to hold down now the shift key to move a report to a folder. In the Reports dialog, you are also able to copy a report to a folder. And so then we also use the Windows Standard Control key. You don't need to remember all this because we put it down at the bottom in a legend. Shift and drag moves a report to a folder. Control and drag copies a report to a folder. Let's go to Inventory Columns next. We've had many requests over the years. Could you add this particular column to the product catalog. Could you add this column to the product catalog? So we've tried to take all these requests together and add them all to the product catalog. They are optional. They will not appear unless you select them. But look at the wealth that you now have. Checks box to see if you want to update this particular product from purchases. The classification. Is it a uh, no count? Is it a serialized item? Is it a rental? The per purchase method, is it associated, is it a drop ship by default, the number of fields for web information, of course our new UPC fields, is an assembly kit or an MTO item, are trade-ins allowed, etc. Lots more information. And finally we have customer name sorting, which is of great use for a set of customers that have a very common set of last names used within the geographical area that they serve. So for example, my wife's maiden name is Rudder. So let's imagine a company which serves a lot of Rudders. In your customer search list, you type in Rudder, and previous to 8.4, all of those first names would be randomly sorted. And it would be difficult to find the person that you're interested in. So now in 8.4, when you sort on last name, we will also sort secondarily on first name. Product descriptions for purchase and for sale to better target your audience. 
an EBMS, when you view a, an inventory item or product, you see a set of checkboxes. Now, previous to 8.4, there was only one column of checkboxes. Now we've broken those checkboxes up into two groups, one for purchases and one for sales, so that you can choose which descriptions are put on purchase documents and which ones are put on sales documents. Example in this case, the Valspar flat paint will appear both on purchase documents and sales documents, but the stock number will only appear on purchase documents. If it contains volatiles and some information on using this paint, will only appear on the sales documents to better target your audience. Vendor catalog, single step update. This is an exciting change to simplify your workflow. How does vendor catalog work? There is a list of parts that is off on the internet somewhere, often being able to be downloaded through FTP, but perhaps it's mailed to you or you obtain it somewhere by yourself. Either way, you usually get it into a file on your local machine. It could be a comma separated list, it could be tab delimited, but it's a file. That file then needs to be transformed into a database file that's compatible with EBMS. And then that database file is used to update EBMS inventory. EBMS supp supplies automation to download the file from FTP and to transform it into a database file. EBMS also supplies the automation to update EBMS inventory from that database file. But what you can see by the difference in arrow colors is it's not a one-step process. You create that DBF file, update that DBF file, but then it's a separate step to update EBMS inventory. In 8.4, we make that a single step process. A new checkbox will appear if your database file is a vendor catalog. Update inventory from modified vendor catalog records after importing. What does that mean? When you run an import through your import export mappings, the file is downloaded, is converted to a DBF, and updates EBMS inventory when that checkbox is selected. As an additional bonus, only the changed products in the catalog are applied, those modified vendor catalog records. What does that mean? Well, if you download new vendor catalogs every week or so, often maybe only 1%, 5%, maybe 10%, of the actual parts have any updates. And so EBMS can take a very long time if you go through a catalog with 100,000 items to update EBMS inventory. But if you only update those change lines, it takes much, much less time to import the changes. Document locking. Preventing collisions one document at a time. Let's imagine a situation where James here is updating a sales order. He's typing in changes to an existing sales order, not a new sales order, making some updates. Maybe he's applying a payment. And we have another worker here who also wants to access that same sales order. And she's perhaps applying a payment as well. Maybe she's adding another detail line. Maybe she's changing the description, uh, maybe changing the ship to. Those edits might conflict, or they might not conflict. Let's imagine another scenario. It could be just one worker. You're on the phone, and you're trying to enter information. You're taking calls. You get distracted. You don't realize that you already have an expense invoice open, and you open another copy of that same expense invoice and type information into that one as well. What will happen when you try to save? You may get this message you've seen before. You've changed data. It's also been changed by another application. And fundamentally, you're frustrated. You can't keep your changes. And you have to enter the information in over again. That's frustrating. And in 8.4, we have a solution for you to drastically minimize that. It's called document locking. And it's at the level of a document. And you can choose at a system level. It's not per user whether you want to enable this document locking feature or not. It's totally optional and up to you. Let's see how it works. So we have James here who is editing away. 
and a worker wants to open up that same sales invoice, and they're presented with a message that James is editing that sales invoice already. And you're given choices. You could open up the document read-only, which would prevent you from typing any information into the header or any of the lists. You could ask to be notified when James is done editing that document. Or, if you feel that your changes are not conflicting with his, you know that, or willing to take that risk, you can go ahead and edit anyway. A final choice you have is to cancel. You'll come back to it later sometime, or maybe it wasn't that important. Let's dive in a little bit deeper in how document locking notification works. If you choose the notify me option, you'll be presented with this message that explains a little bit more about how it works, and you can turn that off with a checkbox when you understand it better. Basically, there are two ways in which notifications are checked. They're either checked at the auto refresh interval, which is in file system options, or there's a new dialog which monitors your document locks and has its own refresh interval. From this document lock monitor window, which can be opened up separately from your invoices, you can watch who's editing what, and you can change your interval. You can also clear locks if you need to. Either way, when James is done and has saved his edits or has canceled out of the sales invoice, a message appears. The sales invoice is now available for editing. Would you like to open it? You don't have to, but if you are still interested, you click on yes, and now you have an editable invoice, and you know that other people's changes have been made, and now you have the lock. An exciting new feature in 8.4 EBMS is integration with Ship Engine. Rate, and, rate shopping and shipping labels for shipments are made simple. This is a partnership between Eagle Business Software and Ship Engine. What we're delivering through this partnership is multi-carrier rate shopping. Multi-carrier, there's a, a set of the carriers that are supported by Ship Engine, FedEx, UPS, USPS, DHL Courier, and many more. Optionally, you can choose to have address validation on your shipments, and Ship Engine will determine for you whether an address is commercial or residential. It, of course, will generate shipping labels, which you can apply to your packages. It's supported on our e-commerce websites as well. And finally, Ship Engine is supported for both the United States and for Canada. Setting up Ship Engine is fairly simple. You go on to the web portal for Ship Engine first, and you configure your carriers. You need to have a account with each of the carriers you're interested in, whether it be USPS, UPS, Perlator, Canada Post. Then you would go into EBMS and you would create shipping methods. You need to create a shipping method for every service type of every carrier which you'd be interested in using for shipments. For example, if you have UPS as a configured carrier, you can choose from any of the service types that UPS provides and you would create a shipping method for each one that you are interested in. Let's see how Ship Engine integration is used in EBMS. First, you need to define your packages. And if you've used Ship Manager before, you'll notice there's a new button at the bottom to rate shop all packages. When that button is pressed, Ship Engine is contacted and we get rate quotes for all of the potential shippers. Let's look at some of the information that comes back from Ship Engine. You may find out that a particular service type is not available. In this case, because it does not have dimensions on the second of the three packages that is appropriate for this carrier. You will get ETA dates, a total cost, which could differ from the ship cost because of insurance that you're paying for separately. There are messages that will tell you if insurance is included, or for example, address verification determined that your address was not commercial, it was actually residential. You choose the rate that you would like from the rate shopping, and then you choose your printer or save to file. Click the Save Print button, and now you have your labels. You can apply your labels to your packages, and off you go.
What else can you do with Ship Engine? Before you send your packages off, if you're satisfied with the shipments that you've chosen, you should click on Apply to Order. Apply to Order takes that total shipment cost for all of your shipments and applies it in the sales order. There's also an estimated shipping button. The estimated shipping button can be used on a proposal if you do not yet have your packages set up, which normally would be the case on a proposal. That way you can use a selected shipping method and based on the box um, limitations and based on the weight of the items, EBMS will generate an estimated shipping cost after communicating with Ship Engine. And this estimation of shipping is also what we use on our e-commerce websites. Other opportunities are, are the track button to track your shipments. You can reprint your labels. But if you decide that you don't want the shipments that you had chosen before, you can click on the void shipment or void individual shipments and then make sure that you do not get charged by the carrier. Another shipping benefit that we deliver in EBMS 8.4 is custom shipper tracking. What does this mean? So outside of Ship Engine, and you would not need to uh, have Ship Engine installed whatsoever, you can add your own shippers. And you would add your own shippers mostly for the benefit of being able to track packages from those shippers. In this case, we have, in addition to uh, some typical package shippers, we have some LTL freight shippers. And they each have their own URLs for tracking packages. So you can define those shippers you can add the tracking URL, and then when you are inside Shipping Manager, you can track the package if you've selected that particular shipper. Also available is a new tracking placeholder in AutoSend. The new tracking placeholder allows emails that are sent out through AutoSend to contain those links grouped by the carrier. Back to you for more great new features in EBMS 8.4. Thank you, Randy. Those are a bunch of exciting new features. We're going to come back to you in a little bit, but let's first look at subcontractor worker payments. Do you have temp or other subcontractors working for you for whom you track time and attendance through the EBMS payroll service? If so, we now have a new feature wherein you can generate an expense invoice for them instead of paying them through direct deposit or payroll check. This will allow you to, at the end of the year, generate a 1099 report as you would any other vendor for whom it's needed. To set this up, go to that worker record change the method to payroll service, and then identify the payroll vendor. If the payroll vendor field is populated, that will trigger EBMS to generate an expense invoice at the time of doing payroll. And then you can go in to vendor payments and pay them just like you would any other vendor. We're happy to introduce the flag pay feature in EBMS 8.4. This allows you to specify an expected time frame in which an operation should be completed and by which you will pay a worker. In the example we have here, we're expecting the first operation to take two hours and the worker will be paid based on that two hour, whether it takes him more time or less time. It took him one and three quarter hours, but he'll be paid at two. And we can see as he goes through his week, he has a mixture of both flag pay that he'll be paid for and hourly work, work by which he'll be paid simply by the hour. And EBMS handles a mixture of the two and will compensate and calculate payroll accordingly. I'd like to talk about a couple of quick features, new features that 
or an EBMS 8.4 before we get into a bigger topic. Internal notes you'll find on sales orders, in manufacturing batches, in tasks, and this is a simple field where internal notes can be stored and they will not be printed on any invoices or other customer facing documents. And finally, a little hidden gem in tasks where we store and record who's clocked into the task and a list of who's assigned so that as you create queries in both EBMS and in my time, you're able to build dashboards and lists that reflect in real time the status of a task. Use tax is one of the defining features of EBMS 8.4. This is a feature clients have been asking for for many years. The ability to calculate sales tax on product purchased from out of state or from another jurisdiction where sales tax was not charged or calculating tax on product that was purchased for resale but is now being used internally. And finally, calculating tax for construction jobs that might be sales tax exempt but for which you're liable to pay tax to the state. In each of these three scenarios, EBMS now does a good job of tracking and calculating the tax you owe. As you upgrade to EBMS 8.4, there are going to be a number of configuration items you're going to need to attend to as you do so. You're going to have to set up liability accounts for use tax and expense accounts for it as well. We have clearly defined steps and processes in our user documentation to guide you through this. On the sales tax settings, you'll need to identify the new liability account you set up. On the inventory items, you'll need to specify that expense account. And there's a variety of other uh, settings as well. This is a very helpful and key part of the EBMS software. And it really starts to shine as you go into jobs and job setting and calculating the taxes at the site level, at the customer level, uh, a variety of other factors as well. Very specifically identifying the taxes that need to be calculated as you pay the use tax for your tax exempt jobs. Use tax is a powerful and helpful feature. And we'll be here to help you as you get this set up and start to utilize it within your business. And now we'll go back to Randy and he'll show us a few more of the features in EBMS 8.4. So let's dive in for the final round of new EBMS 8.4 features. Moving on to AutoSend. We're going to look at the sales payment dialog integration with AutoSend, document level contacts, new AutoSend modes for payments and for tasks, and then finish off with user email settings. The sales payment dialog. You may notice that on the right hand side, there's a set of radio buttons that were not here before. In 8.4, if you have AutoSend installed, you can not only print a report when a sales invoice is processed or a payment is made or down payment, but you can also email. You can do one or both or neither. The email address will default from the sales invoice. You can have configured a default report. And if you wish, you can also display an email dialog to further customize the email you're about to send out. If this checkbox is turned off, then when you process, the email will just be sent out silently. If the checkbox is turned on, however, then you will see the standard auto send send now dialog. And you can modify who it's being sent to from the uh, customer contacts. You can modify the email. Either way is your choice. Let's move to document level contacts. In EBMS, you have for the example of an expense invoice, a vendor, a ship to, and a pay to ID. But what we didn't have before 
was who you were actually talking to. Who is your contact for the bill to vendor? Who is your contact at the pay to vendor? If you're doing a drop ship, who is your contact at the customer that the materials are being shipped to? Now we provide this in EBMS 8.4 on a tab that's called Contacts. And these are the contacts that you would set up for vendors and customers in AutoSend. If you want, by default, on a document, it will be the primary contact. But you can change it by clicking on the Contact button. When you do so, you'll see the list of vendor contacts, so you can choose a different contact, or you can enter one or more additional contacts. Document level contacts are available on multiple documents in EBMS, from a rental contract, expense invoice, sales invoice, and a proposal. How are document level contacts used within AutoSend itself? If you look at the very first entry here, this is new. You may choose as a contact priority to send to the contact which is listed on your document. So previous to this, you would choose by title, the primary contact, or maybe the AP contact, the AR contact, the, the owner, for example. Now you can choose whichever contact it is on the document, that specific contact. But wait, which contact was it? On a sales order, you have a bill to customer and a ship to customer. So we've added this drop down to EBMS 8.4 by which you choose. Is it the bill to contact or the ship to contact? And that also applies to the contact titles. Do we want the primary contact of the bill to customer? Do we want the AP contact of the ship to customer? Finally, there are two other possibilities that are added in 8.4. And there's some special fields that are on the sales order. If you have Shipping Manager, you'll notice that there's an email entry on the Shipping tab. And so you can choose that if there is an email address on that Shipping tab, that that can be one of your contact priorities. There is also, and this has been here for many years in EBMS, hidden away in the Advanced Options screen, an email address on the Sales Order. And that can be one of your options as well. Document Level Contacts in AutoSend. We have two new modes to share today in Auto Send, and the first one is Task Mode. For example, you might want to send out an email to your customer when a phase has been reached in your task. For example, the work has been completed uh, on a particular service, or it could be some intermediate status, intermediate phase that we use on tasks. You would send out the email, very similar to other Auto Send modes. You can access the, the task, but you can also access a sales order that is associated with that task, if one is associated. And in fact, if it's associated with a particular line on the sales order, you can access fields in that detail line. The description, um, dates, you can access subtotals, weights, you can get the order detail from the sales order connected to the task, a variety of information. Something also new you may not have noticed is GLCTL and this is the company information. So at the bottom for example of your template you can put in your company's name and address uh, contact information into your AutoSend template. Task mode also includes send now support so in a task search list or in the task itself you can right click and you can send out an email, including a report, immediately. The other mode to share today is the AutoSend Customer Payments mode. Here you can have, for example, a mode where new customer payments, which have not for, for whom the customer has not been notified yet, can receive an email. Some placeholders you can put in are payment date, you could put in the check or transaction number, but you can also have the payment detail because a sales payment can be distributed to multiple invoices 
And so your customer would want to see what is the breakdown? How much was applied to each of their invoices? And which ones? Finally, in AutoSend, I'd like to present user email settings. And these are optional settings by user that can override the general AutoSend settings. Which settings? The export folder, so this is where documents are placed, your email settings. Why would you use this? For some customers, you want to have a much more personal relationship with your customers. In other words, I don't want to send from info at my company, I want to send from James at my company. Or perhaps you have a departmental email address. So all accounts receivable emails will come from your AR email account. All payables will come from your AP email account. It's up to you, it's optional, and it's available. Webhooks. This is EBMS reaching out to the world. Big step in our integration strategy. You may be familiar with EBMS OData REST API. We've had this for a few years now. This is the way by which the world across the internet can connect to EBMS to read EBMS data, to write EBMS data securely, and also execute processes within EBMS. These are organized by some trigger out on the internet, some third-party process, wants to perform some action in EBMS. So for example, through the OData REST API, you could have a website order checkout. And that would have the action through the OData REST API of creating a sales invoice, including the payment. Another trigger might be a customer email comes in and it references a ticket number. Then you could, through the OData REST API, update that work order or task with a a detail line or perhaps add something to the task notes. Someone could perform an inventory search, one of your salespeople through an app or perhaps through a website, and that would query product availability within EBMS and obtain the pricing. Webhooks take it in the opposite direction to complete the entire circle of integration. Whereas the OData REST API allows the world to communicate into EBMS, webhooks allow EBMS to communicate out to the world. Let's take a deeper look. In this case, EBMS with webhooks has triggers and performs actions out on the internet. Let's look at some examples to see the flexibilities and possibilities with webhooks. A customer payment is processed within EBMS. So a, a confirmation email could be sent out to the customer. A purchase order may be approved to send within EBMS. And so through webhooks, you can define the ability to submit the purchase order electronically to the vendor. The product on hand count could change, and that could be because of receiving, that could be because of sales, could be because of manufacturing, a variety of reasons why the count may have changed. But either way, through webhooks, you can detect that change and you can configure the webhook to update a website. Product on hand count. A couple more examples to show the flexibility of EBMS webhooks. Part information may change. And let's imagine that you have a variety, you have a set of companies that you work with and you want to keep that information synchronized between the multiple EBMS companies. So you could use the webhooks to update the sister EBMS companies. And that becomes essentially webhooks coming out from the main EBMS data set where part information changed and the REST API communicating to the other EBMS data sets. Final example. Say that your vendor's price has changed on a part and it's now the lowest price from all your vendors. Then perhaps you'd like to set that vendor as the primary vendor for your part. You can use an EBMS webhook 
that calls the OData REST API. So coming from your EBMS data set, back into your EBMS data set, the trigger causes a change. These are EBMS webhooks. Very powerful new addition to EBMS 8.4. That's the last highlighted EBMS 8.4 enhancement that we're going to cover today. But the journey to EBMS 8.4 has only just begun. To view the complete list of EBMS 8.4 enhancements, in your favorite search engine, navigate to EBMS 8.4 Enhancements, and that will take you directly to our Enhancements page. Alternately, you can go to info.eaglebusinesssoftware.com, and from our main page, you can then choose Features, Enhancements, that will get you to the same page. As you scroll down, you'll see a number of entries, some of which will include a summary info and details. If you choose the details, it will take you directly to our user documentation, where you'll get more complete information about that feature. At this time, I'm now going to turn it back to you, Nathaniel, to begin our question and answer session. Nathaniel? Hey, thank you, Randy. That was a, uh, a marathon of a lot of new features <laughs> that we have now in uh, EBMS. And uh, really excited about EBMS 8.4, as you can tell, as we've gone through that. And I want to thank everyone again who has taken the time this morning to join us as we go into a, a Q&A period, question and answer. So as we introduced uh, early in the uh, presentation, we have a Q&A here today. In the live event, you should have the opportunity uh, to go in and, and post your questions. We'll try to get to some of them and, and answer them as you post them. I'll be monitoring them, and then uh, Randy and I will discuss them as, as we go through here. So uh, again, uh, appreciate your, your, your interest, your participation here, and uh, look forward to, to engaging through this uh, Q&A time. So one of the things I want to jump into first we'll get started with is is release status and how we release the products we have ebms 8.4 and we've been referencing ebms 8.4 uh here all morning and um i want to talk a little bit about how we manage the releases of that and there's a couple of different layers through which we we go the current status of ebms 8.4 is uh, we call it limited release. So we it's out at a few clients right now, and uh, they're using it in production. Uh, and we're we're kind of working through new features, polishing them, and uh, we're very selective as we as we roll it out to to those clients. And our goal through that uh, exercise is to soon bring it to what we call general release or general availability where we feel confident that it'll serve uh, our client base as a whole across all the various industries, uh, it'll serve them well. So that's, uh, that's a phase we're in right now. That limited release phase is going good and uh, we are looking forward to, haven't made a final decision on when general availability, general release will occur, but it will, uh, we're hoping here, be very soon. Now, um, some of you, and this was a question that was posted, I have EBMS 8.4, but I don't have some of those features. Where are they? So that's a good question. As we do development, we, over the last few years, we've been doing an, a version every year. And that version, so we go 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, that's a major version, but within that version, what we've been doing are it's worked out to about three branches uh, within that version. And what this has allowed us to do is provide some limited release branches of a version early on. And so we have scenarios in which clients reach out to us say we need a specific feature, we work with them, we implement that feature, 
well, and we'll bundle that into a branch that we can then release in a very limited way to a subset of clients. And so this is kind of explaining our numbering system. I'll go into that a little bit because it's it can be a little uh, daunting and confusing. We have uh, EBMS 8.4, the major version. Then the next three digits are the branch. So EBMS 8.4 technically comprises of three branches. The first one was 234. The next branch was 235. And the final branch is 236. Now 236 is the one that we consider the final 8.4 branch. And it, of course, includes all the functionality developed across all three branches. And it's the one that will become generally available. 234 and 235 branches will be um, become unsupported as we transition everyone to that uh, 236 branch within 8.4. So there is some clients who have that early um, that early version of uh, of the software. They don't have all the features, and that is also a way in which we vet and test uh, features before we uh, make it available more broadly. The final numbers um, are the builds. So we have the major version, we have the branch, and then we have the uh, the builds at the end. And builds on all our supported versions, builds comprise of primarily bug fixes. So as we uh, as we go through, um, so we're still doing builds of versions in 8.2, for example. We have many clients on 8.2 or 8.3. These are supported versions of the software, and we're still pushing back uh, fixes um, in there. Uh, when deemed um, important. So not all fixes go all the way back. Minor fixes we won't, uh, but major ones we will push back. And so uh, that build number is how we track where we're at as far as as uh, as the fixes there. So that unpacks a lot of how we manage the development of the software. Every year we have a goal of a version. We build documentation around that. It becomes generally available, general release. And uh, um, but there's multiple steps taken to get to that point. And that's where we are today with EBMS 8.4, 236 branch. We're very close to that generally available um, step. So. That's a release status. That's branches. I'd be happy to hear from you. What what was the most exciting feature you saw in the presentation this morning? Uh, what feature do you see having a big impact on your workflow in your in your business? Be happy to happy to field that. Um, have a question coming in around tax jar and what's tax jar? Uh, tax jar is an integration that uh, is actually available in 8.3. And uh, for those clients who are on 8.3, the integration itself is not, uh, we have not made that generally available yet, uh, but very close to doing so as, uh, um, we're actually working through some things in the interaction between use tax and tax jar with 8.4, as there's some uh, unique interplay that needs to occur there. So we're we're actually at that stage with it, working through that in the context of 8.4. Really excited about tax jar. And uh, that the gener being generally available, uh, I think our beta team is wrapping up some some interactions with clients and some of those are using it very successfully. Others using it in in some some other unique ways that we're still polishing up, but it is coming together. So hoping this summer that we'll be you'll be seeing notification around uh, tax jar general availability. This is uh, a great service that if you are doing shipments across multiple states or you're you're uh, you know working in multi you're, you have presence in multiple states that uh, you, it makes all handling all those taxes across all those jurisdictions so much easier because they keep track of what you should be charging and all the changes 
and EBMS integrate and uh, and tackle that, uh, calculate that. So good. All right. Um, a question come in here on uh, licensing, EBMS licensing. So that's a good uh, a good question. So EBMS currently uses concurrent licenses. So what we track are the number of people using EBMS at any given time, right? So when you say I have um, I have 10 licenses, I've I've subscribed to, I've purchased 10 licenses, and our subscription model, as as you likely know, changed to very focused on the number of users, how many licensed folks you have, and that. We're tracking the number of folks that are using EBMS at any given time. That could be across multiple companies as well. So if I have 10 users, I could have two in, in company A, five in company B, and three in company C. That's your 10, 10 licenses. However, you can configure in EBMS as many licenses as you want. You can install EBMS on as many computers as you want and we're tracking it all at the uh, EBMS data server level. So as you saw uh, earlier, EBMS server manager now has a nice dialogue so you can see at any given time where those licenses are being consumed. So we're make, taking a little bit of a different direction with the apps and I tried to explain that earlier, um, but that's more on named user per company. So if I, uh, these little applets, if you want to call them that, like my orders, my proposals, uh, th there's a subscription that uh, comes with that or that you can purchase and say, I want you know five of my workers within company A to have access to my proposals or my orders. Uh, you get a subscription, five licenses for that, and they can be assigned there to that worker as we uh, the world is shifting to a uh, uh, more of a named worker environment where licensing is done per worker and and it's very dev device agnostic so it's uh, the idea is that the experience is the same across all devices however i'm accessing the system and that's that's a part of of our our uh, direction there with my ebms apps so good Good questions. All right, so some more questions are coming in here. Uh, yeah, and keep um, keep filtering them in. And Randy, I should let you do some talking here shortly. Yeah, you're sitting there quietly. Uh, thank you. Well, we'll have a, a question come in here. Let me process this a little bit. Um, All right, well, this one might get a little technical and, and Randy does well with these. And I'll have to determine whether I can answer it off the cuff here or not. We pay sales tax when buying inventory, but don't charge tax on installed goods. How will the sales tax be calculated for tax paid on purchases resold? So this goes back to that use tax yes. and very much the uh, sales tax exempt jobs, right? And the uh, all the scenarios around around that. And this this was one of the motivating scenarios for doing the work we did with use tax. It's also very complex. Uh, we know there's a, a, a certain segment of our client base that will really benefit from this where they're not required to charge the customer sales tax at the full retail value of the product, but they need to pay the what's called a use tax, which is essentially the sales tax, but it, a use tax on the cost to them as a company, and so they need to calculate that and um, and uh, uh, submit that as as payment to whatever jurisdictions are requiring it. The answer to that is uh, um, likely longer than we can get into there. I don't know if you have anything to add, Randy, but we've documented it in our documentation. Uh, Randy, any input there? No, I think you're exactly right, Nathaniel. And maybe what I'd recommend is after looking at the documentation, if it, if you have a particular use case that doesn't seem to match 
what we've captured so far that you would contact your Eagle Business Software Account Manager to get that evaluated. We really want to hear your impact and the usefulness of this new use tax feature. Yeah, good. Thank you. This this is use tax is very much a defining feature yes. of EBMS 8.4. And uh, just to build a little bit on on what was presented earlier as I talked about use tax, I didn't go in depth with it uh, tremendously, but there's a lot of documentation as EBMS 8.4 rolls out use tax. Uh, will actually be turned off. You're, it's not going to be obvious um, immediately. There is a switch that you'll have to turn on and and then of course uh, once that's turned on and it's activated, you'll need to go in and do that configuration we talked about with the liability accounts, the expense accounts. You'll have to create them and we have that documentation to, uh, to hopefully guide you through that. And if you have questions, of course, our support team is here to to answer those questions. So good. Uh, good question coming in here on shipping and the um, question is how do we find the URL to use for custom shipper and have it plug in the tracking number? So where do we find that URL? Okay, seek and you shall find. Randy, go ahead. Yes, uh, for what all of our examples that we have, we Googled them. In fact, uh, you could for LTL shipments, for example, you could just search for LTL tracking URL and it brings up some sites which uh, cover a lot of carriers. Um, just type in the carrier you're interested in, for example, and uh, and URL tracking URL and you should be able to find it. Yep, and in the URL you just have to identify if you have a Maybe you have a, a, a package already you've shipped through that carrier and you're on that page and you should be able to identify where that uh, shipping the number is number. and replace it with that placeholder, that tracking placeholder. Sometimes it's called a pro number. There's various numbers depending on the shipper. So a lot of good flexibility with that uh, that uh, that ability now with that shipment number URL tracking number. Yes, built in so. We have a lot of clients who do a lot of shipping and of course in the last year that's become more important. A lot of shipping done in the last year. Good. Some other areas of the software I'm excited about and, and again didn't uh, present this earlier is around payments. So there's actually been uh, some significant investment that we've done around uh, payments, electronic payments, things like that and uh, uh, customer ACH payments. So um, with your customer, instead of hitting their credit card, charging their credit card for for uh, a payment is. Um, is uh, entering their bank account information and setting it such that you'll generate an ACH file. It's essentially a tech, uh, specially formatted text file that you can upload on your bank's website. So we did not go to the place at this point where we have an automated um, connection through a payment gateway where these transactions would be handled automatically, but we went to the level where you can generate an ACH file and upload it to your bank. And of course all those funds uh, transfer as they as they should. So uh, that again is is a good way to uh, a great improvement to uh, payments in the business to business world. That's candidly where most of the world has gone with business to business payments and and it's it is really starting to catch on here in the United States. Uh, finally, um, uh, for our Canadian friends, we're really excited about uh, some significant effort we've done around integrated payment processing. So we partnered with a company and we actually have quite a number of Canadian clients and uh, many of them have, have been desiring this for a long time and we we uh, finally found found a partner we could work with uh, to uh, do integrated payment processing credit card processing and so on with terminals and uh, working on the virtual terminal where you can type it in um, online some of those things so uh, some significant things coming there with EBMS 8.4 when it comes to to uh, payments. So talk to your your account manager about those if you're interested. And uh, yeah, good. Uh, have some more questions coming in, and a, and a number of folks actually. The big question is when. 
right? So again, EVMS 8.4, when can we have this? And as we're predicting now, I can see that uh, the floodgates will start to open uh, within the next month. Now we're going to have to, uh, I'm guessing by the end of, I would anticipate by the end of April, we're going to start to see more and more go out. The way we handled the 8.3 rollout um, actually worked relatively well, and that was we would um, every every uh, week or two we'd send a batch of updates out. You'll get an email uh, with steps and things to look for and and what it's going to take to to upgrade. Uh, we will push out that upgrade to your EBMS server manager on your EBMS data server. And so the EBMS admin identified in your EBMS server manager will get an email saying, hey, there's a new version here. And uh, and you'll be uh, there'll be links there to the enhancements page, uh, to other information, and you'll be able to install and uh, and upgrade and go to that. So uh, really hopeful that uh, that you'll start seeing those in your inboxes over the summer. We often uh, will will do a push over the summer on getting these um, released. You can do those upgrades. Good. Maybe I can just emphasize, Nathaniel, that 2.36, 8.4 is in limited release now, and everything you've seen today, with I think the exception of use tax, is in production by clients today. That's right. So it's not vaporware. It's not unfinished. It, it is done and it is in in production. But we do want to make sure that the quality is such and that you'll have you'll have a smooth upgrade experience so we can feel comfortable sending it out to everyone. At this point, it's limited so that we can evaluate on a client by client basis whether you'll have a successful upgrade experience. Great, thank you. Absolutely. And uh, so we have these different phases and uh, the feeling like the limited release phase is going well and that we'll be able to open it up to that general availability very soon. So if there is a a, uh, a feature, um, if there is a feature that really interests you, uh, you know, communicate with support or account management and uh, we can't promise, uh, you know, when it'll happen necessarily, but it's interesting to us to know that a particular feature will have a big impact in your business, and uh, that may uh, be a consideration as we as we pull this together, uh, the release of this uh, coming together. So, good. A uh, question on uh, product, um, kind of outside of what we looked at today, but a uh, question on multi-currency ability uh, in EBMS, especially Canadian versus uh, uh, U.S. dollar. So. There, our Canadian, our Canadian partner, and we have a, a, a distributor in Canada handles the Canadian market, and they've developed out some feature sets specific to the Canadian market. They they um, developed out a multi-currency mo uh, module or feature set, and uh, so the question is, are is there any work being done on adding multi-currency ability? So there is some ability already there. And it may not work for everyone. The, the feature set is not expansive, but it's been very functional and uh, helpful for our uh, primarily our Canadian clients who might have an American bank account, as is common, have both both types of uh, bank accounts and do a lot of business uh, back and forth across the border. So there is some capability there. And uh, we'd love to chat uh, some more if you have that need. And and uh, we have some agreements with our partner there that uh, we may be able to work out and get that in your hands if uh, if interested. So okay, good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Opening it up here. Appreciate the questions coming in. And uh, happy to to comment or or field any more of them. Another area uh, that I'd like to talk about a little bit, uh, Randy, is around the our e-commerce customer portal. So about 
a, a, to almost two years ago now, as we were looking at our product offering, um, and we looked at what we had on the e-commerce side, and, and we evaluated that, and we, we identified that we were doing quite well in the business-to-business -business, um, environment and, and serving our clients who are doing business-to-business. A lot of other uh, folks were doing very well in, uh, you know, a lot of websites out there doing really well in the uh, business to consumer B2C market. And so over the past year and a half, as we've been investing in our e-commerce product, we've been focusing on the B2B, business to business, distribution, uh, big orders, things like that. And uh, we're pleased in the direction it's gone and how it has really been helping our clients ha you know, have that customer portal order history where um, their customers can go in and make payments, place orders. Really excited about some of the features that are coming to our customer portal to, uh, to enable um, better interaction between you and your customer. And uh, over the past year, of course, that's uh, become a very popular product and uh, we've been investing heavily in it. So again, uh, that's another product here over the past year that we've been investing a lot into. One, two, uh, uh, had a question coming in here on time clock. Excellent. Mm. This is something we didn't talk about, Randy. And um, true. Give my voice a break. Do you want to talk about the new uh, Windows Store app? Yes, we have totally revamped the time clock application. And now it is a completely Windows Store compatible app. Uh, it's, it's beautiful looking, uh, but we will not be supporting in 8.4 the previous time clock app. You will need to upgrade to the new one, and I think you will just absolutely love how it is uh, just totally modern Windows user interface. Yeah, excellent. So we actually did that in 8.3. Uh, that that new Windows Store app is available in 8.3. So if you go to the Windows Store, search for Time Track app, I believe it'll uh, search for Time Track. I believe it'll show up. You can download it and install it on your Time Clock device. Of course, you need to have the the community pack or feature pack that that has the uh, the time clock feature. Um, one of the motivating reasons why we did that is because in many cases you have a, a, a tablet up on the wall, lunchroom, wherever it might be, and when you go to upgrade from one version of EBMS to the next, it uh, it would all often get forgotten and it wasn't getting updates. So the other way of installing, it wasn't getting updates. And so then it would break or it just didn't have the latest fixes and so on. And one of the beauties of the Windows Store is that it's receiving that update automatically. So it's always current. And this has just made it uh, from an admin perspective so much easier. And like Randy said, it, it's a lot prettier than, than the old one. So uh, really pleased about the Windows Store app. Can I mention two little features as I'm thinking about them, Nathaniel? Go ahead, sir. Oh, I was thinking, oh, I should have presented these today, but there's just not enough time. But here's a moment here. We've added online help to EBMS. So previously, if you would go to uh, press the F1 key or search for help, you'd see help that is within EBMS. And now it'll take you directly to our website and we'll search there for help either F1 or right click online help and use the information in the, the field or wherever you are that you need help for. If you do not have internet, uh, you can turn off that feature and use the built-in help if you would like. The other feature you might have noticed in the slides, I think I passed by it very quickly, you might have seen a double red underline in some text. In EBMS 8.4, we support spell checking. And this uses the Windows native spell checker that's available in Windows 8 and higher. And so you'll see uh, spelling errors uh, in uh, text controls where you can uh, add an unlimited amount of text, uh, usually multiple line fields. Right click and it will give you the spelling suggestions, which you can pick and now have spelling checker. Yeah, good. Thank you, Randy. 
Yes. Yeah, so Bo Spellcheck now in the memos, uh, helping you, uh, helping you there as you're typing, and giving you immediate feedback. And uh, and then yes, the online help feature. Uh, we've been working on our knowledge base, our documentation online. Info.eaglebusinesssoftware.com is the website where we're client focused, trying to aggregate and bring the uh, information that uh, is helpful to you, the client. And so we've been, you should be seeing uh, significant changes happening there as we've been building that out, trying to bring more value to that website to serve you better. And we've got a lot more video content there. We've got blogs, we have uh, the user documentation. We've been investing heavily in the user documentation over the past year, really put a focus there. And that's all accessible now, like like Randy said, from within EBMS. If you right click in EBMS and the menu that comes up, there should be an online help uh, option there and it'll it'll automatically push certain keywords over to the uh, website and help with your search and hopefully bring relevant information up. We don't always know exactly what you're looking for, but we, we try to help expedite that directly from within the EBMS software. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that. And again, there's so much more on that EBMS enhancements page that uh, that Randy referenced. So that's that's good. Um, uh, there, uh, here's another little uh, little Easter egg, as we sometimes call it in the industry, little hidden thing. And uh, it was suggested here by uh, actually one of my colleagues just posted in here saying we have a, a small calculator in the number fields. Yes. 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 Thank you for suggesting that, uh, Marvin. So talk to us about that, Randy. Yes. If you would like to perform calculations within EBMS in a numeric field, then you can actually type it in. Uh, you know, equals six plus seven, and it will give you the result. You do not have to do calculations on your separate calculator on your desk anymore. You can perform those calculations within EBMS. Yeah. So any number field is now your calculator and uh, I've used that myself a number of times and it's just it's not obvious uh, you know it's one of those things kind of little hidden gems that's now built right into the uh, the software so um, yeah some excitement here coming out around uh, auto send and customer billing and that automation and and I will say EBMS does really well now with if you have a recurring billing scenario, a subscription or uh, uh, some situation like that where you can set them up on auto pay essentially and it'll come up monthly, generate an invoice. From that you can generate your ACH file and once that has been processed, EBMS will automatically send a notification, an email to your customer, letting them know what has occurred. Here's a receipt, whatever information you want to send to them. So a lot of excitement uh, coming up in the chat on that. And a question on use tax, uh, wondering if it's a US thing or a Canadian thing. Oh. Well, it's very much a US thing, uh, just primarily because uh, tax laws in the US are very complex. So uh, this is to deal with that. Um, the Canadians have a much simpler tax structure and uh, so it really doesn't bring value to the uh, Canadian market. Their uh, that tax structure is, uh, EBMS handles quite well as is so yeah. Good good thanks for the questions coming in. Um, I have another one here um, on OData is OData API and webhooks the only way to integrate a website? Hmm. Well, that uh, good question. Let's talk about how we can interact yes. with EBMS and how EBMS is fun to play with uh, with other systems. Go ahead, Randy. Yes. Is it the only way? No, but it is the best way. Uh, if you look at integrating with almost any system that is not the cloud, available over the web today or even within your local network, a REST API and webhooks are the modern way to do so. And that is what virtually every system uses. Now there are some older systems that would use uh, 
importing through CSVs, um, uh, flat files, uh, and we have our existing uh, EBMS Windows COM API, and those all still work. But for modern integrations, we absolutely recommend our REST API and webhooks. That is totally uh, standard within the industry today. Yes, so again, thank you for the question, and we're very pleased with the, the API and the webhooks. Very, very feature rich. Uh, I'm more and more impressed with that. I get into that world a little bit. I don't feel myself as a programmer, but I, I know enough to be dangerous and I play with some of these things and I see other APIs that are out there with other products. And I will say uh, I'm very pleased with what the team here has done. It is a very modern API. It, it's as modern about as you're going to get. Uh, so we're really pleased to have rolled that out. Uh, we also have um, another product that you may want to consider if you do an integration uh, and that is our, our SQL mirror and SQL database and depending if you're pulling copious amounts of data at one time and in certain scenarios uh, you may want to actually pull that data from a SQL database so that you're not putting a load on the on the EBMS data server especially if that has to be done during peak operation time and so on but you know, so there's there's numerous tools that can be used, leveraged. It's not always sometimes both and. Uh, so it depends on what you're doing as to what may be the best uh, way to approach it. But the API is and the webhooks, especially now with webhooks, uh, that really really re, uh, makes makes integrations much easier. So excited about that. Yeah, you mentioned SQL Mirror, Nathaniel. I'll mention that in 8.4, you can host your SQL database in Azure. So an Azure DB, which is much, much easier to maintain and set up and less expensive. Uh, that is supported in 8.4, Azure DBs. There you are. He found, Randy found another thing that's uh, new in 8.4. I've forgotten about that. I think it's on the enhancements list, but being able to, uh, you might have your server EBMS data server local on your local network, but it can now keep a SQL database in Azure updated. And of course you can report from that. So yes. EBMS will go up and, and pull data from that. And depending on the report, especially if it's a lot of transactions, it's much more efficient to use that SQL database. And we have found, yeah, you mentioned the cost, uh, Randy, you mentioned the cost and yes. and the Azure SQL database, the requirements that EBMS has for an Azure SQL database are such that it's about the cheapest. You can get a lot of performance, a lot of improvement out of a very inexpensive Azure SQL database. So uh, very excited about, about that. Easy to maintain, super performance. We've had reports, sorry. Uh, some clients have told us that there's reports that have run for maybe an hour before and can now run in less than a minute. It's yes. amazing. Amazing. Yeah, this is the power of the SQL database when you have lots of transactions. So go from an hour down to a minute. Uh, we'll take that operationally. Yes, good. Yeah, so uh, EBMS 8.4. Lots to love. Check out the uh, enhancements page and um, reach out with any with any questions. We want to be here to, to help you leverage the value that's there in EBMS to better support your operations, to better support your financial uh, back-end business management needs, and we're really excited about uh, what the what the future has here. So, yeah, definitely uh, some excitement coming in here around uh, the spell check, the built-in calculator, document locking. Mm. Uh, that's right. It's it's the little things that matter that make a big difference. And we could mention as well uh, some things we've been focusing on around performance. Uh, we've been digging in and looking at areas where we can speed up the software if there's opportunities there. And uh, you know, there's there's some limitations to what we can do, but we have actually taken the uh, in, the opportunity initiative to to look at some of those. So, um, yeah, I I think we're going to uh, wrap up here in a minute or two, uh, but again, very appreciative of the engagement here this morning, the opportunity to sit down and, and talk about EBMS, 
where it's going, what the next year is going to look like as far as uh, uh, product and, and feature sets. And we appreciate your partnership as you uh, use EBMS. What brings us energy is bringing you value. And uh, that's what uh, this morning is, is all about, is, is sharing with you some of the feedback from that's come from you, how it's been incorporated into the software, and now, of course, for us, looking forward to the next year as we roll out these new new feature sets uh, to each one of you to leverage. So, again, thank you for joining us. And Randy, any final words on your end before we wrap up the meeting? No, I appreciate your participation, and please keep the feedback coming so that we can make ERP work for you. All right, thank you, Randy. With that, I think we'll call it a wrap. Thank you for joining us today.